the classic passage on the gifts of the Holy Spirit is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are some biblical teachings that stand out clearly in the Bible about the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to give you six of them. Number one is that the first principle is that spiritual gifts, we are talking about the spiritual gifts now. And what I said, the classic passage about the spiritual gifts is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It is the classic passage with regards to spiritual gifts. The first principle is that spiritual gifts must be differentiated from natural gifts. We all have natural gifts. All human beings have natural gifts. And these this are different from one person to another. There are some people who believe that spiritual gifts, that they are the heightening of these natural gifts. That when a man is born again, that God heightens these natural gifts or he blows them up or he magnifies them, these natural gifts, to become spiritual gifts. This is not true. The natural gifts, they are different from the spiritual gifts. Some people have fallen into this error. They have taught that God takes a person's natural gifts and blows it up to become more vivid so that it becomes a spiritual gift. Now let me give you a definition from a Greek lexicon. A Greek Christian lexicon. It says that spiritual gifts are extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christian and enabling them to serve the church of Christ the reception of which is due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit so spiritual gifts are gifts directly from the Holy Spirit to a believer when he is born again number two the second principle is that these gifts are bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit in a sovereign manner this is emphasized clearly in 1 Corinthians 12 11 1 Corinthians 12 11 that when God gives us this spiritual gifts he gives it to us in a sovereign manner remember that God is sovereign in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 11 I read but all these walk it that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will in other words God gives these gifts to us as he wills you can see the word there as he will it is he who divides the gifts to those to the children of God it is not us it is him that divides the gift and this is very important for you to know so that there is no boasting about your gift it is given to you by God as he wills he decides what particular gift to give to a particular person praise the name of the Lord it is important for us to bear this in mind it is what he likes 
that he gives to each and every one of us. Number three, the third principle. Each Christian is given and has therefore some gift. In verse 27, it says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. And if we go to verse 11, or I'm talking of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you see, but all this worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. The clear implication is that every single person is given some particular gift. Every child of God has a gift. That is the third principle. That every child of God, each Christian is given and has therefore some gift. There's nobody that is left behind. You may, you may not have discovered your own gifting of the Holy Spirit, but every child of God has a gift. And the illustration of what I'm talking about, you find it in verse number 12. The apostle uses the human frame to illustrate what I am talking about. In verse number 12 he says, For as the body is one, and are many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, verse 13, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. In other words, everybody in the body of Christ, everybody, everybody has a gift. Some gifts are more comely than others. In other words, some gifts are more important than others. And you find that in verse 23. Though everybody is important, just like all the members of our body, they are important. Your little finger. Nobody can just come and slice your little finger and you just say bye-bye. Somebody chops off one of your fingers and you say bye-bye. No, all members of your body, they are important. But there are some members that are more important than others. And that is what you find in verse 23. And it says, And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon this we bestow more abundant honor. And our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. In other words, there are some parts. They may be small. No matter how small they are, they are important to us. Nobody will say, well, this little finger, they are disturbing me. They are not doing anything. I'll chop it off. Or oh, my toes. My little toe. It's not doing anything. So I'm chopping it off. No. We protect all members. Even those that are not very, very important. We protect them. But the, but the important thing to understand is that some members are more comely and also that every child of God has a gift because sometimes when people are preaching about the, this gift they give the impression that it's only pastor, it's only some special people, only bishops that have the gifts of the Holy Spirit it is not so it is not so everybody, every child of God 
as a gift. You may not have discovered the gift that you have. Amen. Number four, the gifts, they differ in value. All of the gifts are not the same. As I said, some are more comely than the others. In verse 14 to 15, and I read, For the body is not one member, but, more, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Verse 28, And God has sent some in the church. First, apostles. Secondly, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing. Helps. Governments. Diversities of tongues. You see how Paul compares one to the other. If I ask you now, if you are in a position to lose one, your little finger on your right hand or your eye, you see, certainly you want to give away your little finger. If you are asked to give up one, what I'm trying to say is that all of the gifts, they do not have the same value. They differ. And you can see in verse 22 and 23, the apostle compares these gifts. He said, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. He says, More feeble. Some are more feeble. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon this we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. All gifts, they are not the same. They differ in value. You see, these things are simple to, they are simple to explain and they are simple to understand, especially if you read them straight from the Bible. You see, what a man cannot explain, if you cannot explain a thing, then don't expect me to understand it. Or let me say one thing. What only one man knows is not worth knowing. Did you hear what I just said? Let me say that again. What only one man knows it's not worth knowing. And in the sciences, it's the same. And even in the scriptures, it's the same. What only one person knows. All of these things, they are written for us who live at the end of the ages so that we can know them. They are simple. It is that simple. You know, there are some people who deduce revelation from anything and they make it difficult. You know, I've said it before, there are some people who go to, there are some times you go to the church and the pastor is talking, talking, talking. That's one group. Let me start from the, in fact, from the first group. The first group is you go to a church in which from the beginning to, a, to the end is all prophecy and a, about miracles. From the beginning, from, for that one hour, it's all talking about uh, prophecy and miracles. A kind of entertainment. By the time you go home now, somebody asks you, wait till pastor talk. Eh, eh, ah, I don't know, sure, but uh, the, the service is sweet. The service is sweet. Ah, they said from the beginning to the end, action. Action, action. What does that mean? some kind of dramatizing miracles, some kind of fake things. You, you come here, you that man in the red shirt, this there, that is the whole service. That's one group. 
The second group are some people who come and talk, 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 talk. <laughs> and everybody is looking and they don't understand. You get home and they're asking you, what did pastor talk today? Uh, he talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, what did he talk? What did he talk? Hey, I don't understand though. The man, eh? Hey. The man, he really goes to school where, well, where? Well. The man goes to school, he goes to school, he goes to school. Ah, he goes to school. I, I never see man when he goes to school like that. See you both just they follow him. See vocabulary, just they follow one after the other. Okay, what did he talk? Then, what is the purpose of preaching? If you cannot calm down and explain. If you have a revelation and you cannot explain the, the revelation to your mother, to, to your illiterate mother, then it's not what, it's not what knowing. You cannot explain it to the church. Ah! No, this thing is too, is too high. Then it's not what knowing. You see, you see this Colossus of an apostle. It is simple. It is there, simple. For you to read it and for you to understand it. Amen, somebody. We have definite teaching in the Bible that gifts differ in value. If you go to 1 Corinthians 14.5, The Apostle Paul says, I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. I want you to listen to that. He said, I would, I would have preferred that all of you speak in tongues because that was what, happened, what was happening in the Corinthian church. It was tongues, tongues, tongues galore. So the Apostle Paul says, I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. The word prophesy here is not prophetic, it's not fortune telling. It's rather that you preach. Rather that you speak eloquently. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues. The tongue is that when a man Well, that is perhaps Chinese. That's the tongues is talking about. Now, how many people understand that Chinese that I spoke? So put up your hand if you understand. <laughs> Even the Chinese man will not understand. You see, but the way I'm speaking now, how many people understand the way I'm speaking now? You see, everybody here, that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. That it is better for a man to speak, to prophesy, to teach, to speak the way I'm speaking now, than to speak in tongues. He said, unless if the man who is speaking in tongues, if that tongue is interpreted to the church, that the church may receive edifying. As I'm talking to you now, the whole process of my talking to you is to edify, is to teach. But if I'm speaking in Chinese, nobody would understand. So what the apostle is saying, that one gift is better than the other. Because to teach is a gift. And to speak in tongue is a gift. So the apostle is saying that it is better to, to teach, to speak, to teach the way I'm doing now, than to speak in tongues. 
Because when you are speaking in tongue, except there's an interpreter, you will not understand. So you see, what does it show? That these gifts, that they differ in value when it comes to edifying the church. That the gift of prophesying, the gift of teaching is more valuable than the gift of tongues. Amen. Verse number 18 and 19, First Corinthians 14, and I thank God, and I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet, in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in Chinese in unknown language. That it is better to speak Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Three words. In my voice, in the language in which you understand. Than to speak. For one hour. Because when you get home and somebody asks you, what did Pastor talk? You say, Jesus loves you. Oh. Eh? I didn't know that. I used to think that Jesus doesn't love me because of my sin. Pastor said Jesus loves you. Wow, that's a great word. Than staying here and speaking in a job. How many people understand the joy here? Put up your hand. You see, only a few people. Or even in Shakiri. How many people understand Shakiri? Put up your hand. You see, only a few people. How many people understand English here? Put up your hand. Everybody. That's what the apostle. Does that make sense? Amen, somebody. That's what the apostle is talking about. The fifth principle is this. All gifts, any gift, must always be used in love. That is that is the queen. The queen principle. All gifts must always be used in love. And in fact, the classical passage for this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I read, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. A man may come here and talk, 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 talk with arrogance. Without love, he says it's nothing. It's nothing. It is for this reason that the Apostle Paul says, when I came to you, I didn't come with words of wisdom. When I came to you, I came to you because I wanted to know whether you have been crucified with Christ. That is why I came to you. I determined not to know anything about you. I didn't come with words of wisdom, the wisdom of men, 
The main reason why I come here, I stand in front of you every Sunday, is to say something to help you. I am conscious of the fact that the Lord is sitting down here and is listening to me. I must humble myself. I must select the words that I use. For this reason, you see I speak broken. I speak any language, any illustration I can grab in order to make you understand. The purpose is not to show my oratory. The purpose is for you to understand the word of God and apply it in your life. It's not just for you to know, for knowing sake and to brag with it. It's to edify you. It's so that you can be sanctified. You can move from one level of sanctification to the other. We are not even gathered here to collect money. It is for this reason, we don't even talk about I mean money. It is for this reason this church is designed the way it's designed. The offering boxes about there, they're all there so that you rest your mind and listen to the word of God and receive it. Any word that you receive and you cannot apply it to your life, then it's not worth listening to. We are careful about this. So, and that is why, first of all, we worship the Lord so that the Lord can come and open your ears to listen to the word of God. If not, my preaching and all what I say will be in vain. This is Father's house. You are not in the university where you take an exam. There is no exam for you. Here. If there's any exam that you have to take, it's between you and you. You are the student and you are also the supervisor. If you want to cheat yourself, you can cheat yourself. Is to hear the word of God, to understand it in such a way that you can do it. You can put it into practice. Amen. So, let's do the reading. It says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You see that comparison that the apostle gives. Though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, even if you speak like an angel, and there's no love in your voice, there's no love in your heart. He said, You are just making noise like a simba. He said, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, he said, I am nothing. Whatever the gift, it must be used in love. Which indeed entitles us to say that you should never judge a person's spirituality solely in terms of the gifts that he possesses. We have said this over and over again that many times when you see people with the gift of healing it may be from the Lord. It may be from the Lord. But that does not mean. You know, many times sisters, they fall into this trap. Oh, they see an evangelist, perhaps a healing evangelist is a man of God. With the gift of healing, they immediately equate healing with sanctification. Healing with holiness. If this man has this gift, ah, he must be holy. That's the man to marry. Or if this man can sing like this, hey, and people were falling down when he was singing. 
Ah, he must be the man to marry. I'm sure many sisters, they know what I'm talking about already because many have been born. When they see brothers who sing, and that is the man they want to follow, only to discover that, whoo, whoo, oh, wow. Sing, sing, so they go put me for trouble. So, all of these gifts, they must be used in love. If you are not using any gift in love, if the purpose of any revelation does not edify the church, if the purpose of preaching is just to show off that I know, if a man is preaching for one hour and you cannot understand, you cannot take home, what is the theme of this talking now? Where is this talking leading to? Just talk here, talk here, talk here, talk here, talk here, talk there, talk there, talk there, talk there, talk here, and all that. And you are asking yourself, so where all of this one they lead to? So any time there is a preaching, the first question you go ask, you will ask is that, Natatitic. Natatitic. Now we go chop. Amen, somebody. Because there must be a spiritual food. You must gain something. It's not just talking and talking and talking. There must be something that you have to take home with. Amen, somebody. Number six, there are those who will say that unless we have possessed or manifested a particular gift, we have never been baptized by the Spirit or have never known any fullness of the Spirit. I'll take for example, there are some people who will say, that if you don't speak in tongues, for example, is a sign that you have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is not correct. There is nothing to indicate from 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, there is nothing to show that. There are people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and do not speak in tongues. Many people speak in tongues because perhaps it is the last gift. But there are people certainly who are baptized in the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, and don't speak in tongues. There is not a single gift mentioned here in, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 of which we are told that it must be present. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Rather, we are told that one person has one gift and another a different gift. They are all different gifts. And nobody knows the gift that he will receive. There is no universal gift which is a sign that you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. What I'm saying, it is there for you to read. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. There is nothing like a universal gift. Now, what is the purpose? These are the six principles, general principles that all of us must know with regards to spiritual gifts. Then, the second thing that we have to know is that what is the purpose of these gifts? What is the purpose? You can find the answer in Ephesians 4.11. The purpose of the gifts. Because, you see, yesterday I was listening to something strange. And I don't know whether you... Well, some people have been seated for so, for so long hours 
that perhaps they did not listen. They were not observant enough. What is the purpose of this gift? It is very clear in Ephesians 4.11. In fact, 4.12. Verse number 12. He said, for the perfecting of the saints. That's number one. Are you seeing there? The perfecting of the saints. For the work of ministry. Number one, perfecting of the saints. For the work of ministry. This ministry is not ministry of internal affairs. Or ministry of external affairs. Or ministry of finance. Or ministry of transportation. This is ministry in the house of God. Then number three, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith. Till all of us come. That is the purpose of this gift. So that all of us can be one in the body of Christ. We can understand one another. We can mature as Christians. And that we can come to the knowledge of the Son of God. A full knowledge of the Son of God. Now, let me say something again in line with this. There is a distinction between the body of Christ and the nations. In the New Testament, when you hear the nations, when you hear God has sent us to the nations, the nations means the world. It's another word for the world. It's another word for where worldliness abounds. It's another word for ungodly people, wicked people. That is the meaning of the word nations. The body of Christ is all those who have been born again. The Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit, it is the same function of the Holy Spirit that baptizes them, that brings them into the body of Christ. My wife and I and many brethren, we have traveled in a lot of places. Yesterday I was showing you the, the church in Antioch so that you believe. That church that you find in the, in the book of Acts chapter 15, the church in Antioch, Antioch, Syria. There are two Antiochs, the Antioch, Syria and Antioch, Pisidia. What we notice is that all Christians who are born again, they are the same. They have the same spirit all over the world. It's very interesting. The way they talk, the way they carry themselves and talk to you. The, the same, we have the same word, the same Bible, the same demeanor, the same humility, the same. And sometimes we sing songs that we don't even understand the meaning. We don't even want to understand the meaning. But somehow, there's a meaning in our heart. And I'm just singing that and I'm crying. Without any words. In a strange language. Do I understand the songs that they sing in Igbo in this church? No. But they, they move me to tears. Or the ones in Yoruba, or the ones in uh, Isoko, or the ones in Urobo, I don't understand. Even the ones in Shekiri, I don't even understand. I cannot, I don't think in Shekiri. Praise the name of the Lord. I cannot think in Shekiri. I cannot pray. In Ishakiri. I cannot preach in Ishakiri. I don't know the meaning of the word philosophy in Shakiri. The body of Christ is all those who are born again.
the Holy Spirit baptizes them into one body. All Christians in different nations are all in the same body of Christ. Whether in Russia, in America, in Burundi, in uh, uh, Swaziland, or in Switzerland, they are all in the same body. There is no American Holy Spirit. There is no Nigerian Holy Spirit. Thank God that there is no Nigerian Holy Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. If there were a Nigerian Holy Spirit, we would have been in trouble by now. Because the Holy Spirit will come before we manipulate all of us here. Even Tali will manipulate me. And teach us another thing. But thank God, the Holy Spirit is one. The second person, I mean the third person of the Trinity. Shall we put our hands together? The Holy Spirit. of the Holy Spirit is not for the perfecting of the nations. Because it appears that this was the allusion that was made yesterday. The gifts of the Holy Spirit is not for the perfecting of the nations. They are not for the edifying of the nations and they are not for the administering of the nations. It is for the body of Christ, not for the world. So, because it is not so, because they are only for the perfecting of the body of Christ, of the, of the saints, they are for ministry, ministering of the body of Christ and they are for the edifying of the body of Christ. It is not for the perfecting of the nations. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, let me take for example now, the gifts of the Holy Spirit does not empower Christians who have the gift of, admin, of administration as we see in the New King James Version or in the King James Version to participate in party politics. Because that was what they are, one of the speakers was alluding to. That we Christians, we have the gifts of administration. And that we, because we have the gifts of the administration, we can become the president of Nigeria. No. We can participate in party politics. No. These gifts, they are in particular for only the body of Christ. And not for the nations. The fact that a man has the gift of ministry and is doing well with that gift of ministry in the body of Christ, that does not mean that that gift is going to function in the world, in party politics. Are you seeing the difference of what I'm talking about? Because that was the allusion that was made yesterday, and which is wrong. Which is wrong and is not correct. Now, let me say something now, and then we will close. There is distinction between party politics or what you call party politics in a democracy and the kingdom. Now, what I'm talking about now, I'm not talking about the kingdom of God now. I'm talking about the world. Those of you who, those of you who know political science better, I mean, better than me, please just be gracious unto me. What I'm saying is this. There's a difference between two nations. One, is a democracy, the other one is a kingdom. Amen. In the one with a democracy where there's a party politics, there are different parties, 
you have to politic before your party wins, then you come to the position of governance. Isn't it? As it is in Nigeria. But in a kingdom, also in the world, there is no party politics because there's a ruler. Isn't it? Now, in the party politics, for you to get to the point, a position of governance, you must participate in party politics. Isn't it? But in the kingdom of the world, there is already a king seated on the throne. And he sits there forever. And there is no party politics below him. Amen. So for a man to be, get to the position of governance in the kingdom, what happens? He has to be what? Appointed. He has to be appointed. Amen. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. Because where I'm going now is the mistake, the error that many Christians do. You see, <clears throat> Joseph in the Old Testament is often cited as a Christian, as a child of God who was involved in politics. <laughs> was Joseph involved in politics? Praise the name of the Lord. You see, you are even smarter than me. Anytime we are talking about Christians in politics, you know, politics is not only that it is worldly, it is more worldly than the world. Hey, wait to tell you what did they talk again? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. What I'm saying, that's what you call the world. But there are some people that are more worldly than some. And there are some institutions that are so worldly inside the world that even the worldly people are saying, I beg, I beg, I cannot be a part of it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. What I'm saying, politics is so worldly than even the world. So for you, to get to an elected position in politics in the world, you have to do what the world does for you to be elected into a position of governance in the world. You cannot be wanting to aspire to a position in the world without doing what the world does to arrive in that worldly position in that worldly government. So what is democracy there for? It is the government of the worldly people by the worldly people and for worldly people and for worldly purpose They cite Joseph often as the child of God who was in politics. Now look at Joseph. You all know this story. Look at poor Joseph. Eh? See Joseph. See Joseph, my, 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 my younger brother, that does nothing. Who was going to help the brother? Catch the boy. Put him in pit. From there, sold him as a slave. Slave boy in the house. And then Madame now, he looked the boy, look the boy muscles. Ah, this boy, this boy fine now. Oh. Ooh, how's the boy be? Shoe? The boy fine. Pursue the boy. The boy, madam, leave me now, madam. Come here, fine boy. Come, come here. Come on, come on, come here, come here. And the boy was in trouble. From there, small boy, yo. We don't know anything. Put him into prison. Was in prison. From there now, they interpret dream. Can you just impact, interpret dream? It comes from God now. Isn't it? Nobody went to school of... Joseph didn't go to the school of interpreting dreams. You know, dreams are terrible. All kinds of dreams. Did I tell you before that the type of dream that I dream... Huh, 
if you dream up. Have you dreamt before? In which, this is one dream that I dreamt. I dreamt I was in the coffin. They were carrying me to the cemetery to bury. And in the entourage of the people carrying the coffin in which I was there, I was also in the entourage leading the people who were carrying my coffin to the cemetery to bury. Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> And I woke up to see that this is the type of dream that I dream. What did I do? Nonsense. I just cancelled the dream and threw it in the dustbin. The devil can attack my dream, but he cannot attack me. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. I'm not a man that dream with dream. A dream. Well, you can dream. You can come into my dream, but you cannot come to me face to face because I'm going to tell you to get out. Amen, somebody. Joseph was interpreting dream in prison. From there, the king heard about him. And they appointed him. Appointment. If Joseph had gone to contest in Egypt, first of all, he would not even qualify for the primary. Because in the first place, he's not even an Egyptian. The point I am making is this. The spiritual gifts generally and especially the spiritual gift of government according to King James or administration according to New King James is not for the nations. It is not for the perfecting of the nations. It is not for the perfecting of the world. This world that you are seeing now, it will get worse and worse and worse. That's what the Bible says. In the last days, in the end times, thieves, adultery, rebellious people, all kinds of people, kidnappers, when I was a small boy in Warri here, there was nothing like homosexuality. There was nothing like lesbianity. There was nothing like, there was nothing like kidnapping in Warri. I grew up in Warri here as a small boy. Nothing. But today, even me, that was an opaiku in this Warri, I'm even afraid to go out in the town in which, in which I grew up. Praise the name of the Lord. And by the time some of you here will be my age too, in fact, you will be afraid to even look through the window. <laughs> Things will become worse. But guess what? For the children of God, God will do what? Raise a standard that they themselves, amen, that when you see a child of God at that time, it's not the way that we are now. We are still gentle. Amen. You see, there are some people who come to this church and they say we are singing hymns. That was some of the things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with hymns. You know, there are some Nigerians, the way they talk. Eh, why, why do you sing all of this music? Why don't you sing your own? I say, which one is your own now? Hymns. Are hymns your own? These hymns that were, I mean, that were written about 300 years ago, you are still singing them. And look at the way they are singing hymns. The words are good, the words are okay, but the music is not compatible with a modern man. Amen, somebody. They were written by men. They are, I mean, and those men, they are dead. By infallible people. So we are going with the trend. We are going with the trend. Where sin abounds, our sin is rising up. We too, we are rising up with it. Amen. We are not going to snack. Amen, somebody. Shall we put our hands together for the Holy Spirit?